Christ. We're very happy to have everyone this morning. If you happen to be visiting uh, this morning, um, either with the uh, Hagelin family or I happen to have two friends here from Massachusetts who told me they were coming Sunday evening and wouldn't you know they showed up for worship. So I hope that you have an opportunity to meet Penny and Barb and we're happy that everybody is with us for this very special Sunday. Um, there is a guest book in the back of the church that we'd enjoy for you to sign if you're visiting and let us know where you're from. Uh, other than that, I'd like to point your attention at the announcements later in the program. Uh, Curtis has been in and out of the hospital this week. <laughs> We're very happy that he's here um, and he's feeling better. Uh, a special announcement uh, from the men of the church about the men's pancake supper. It will be on October 29th from 4.30 until 7. All right, I got that right. Um, I would say see any of the uh, men who were involved with the Pancake Supper for tickets. And a reminder that um, the ladies are always invited to bring some uh, desserts. Uh, squares, is that what you told me? Sure. sure. <laughs> oh, anything you really like to cook. Or maybe you like to eat. So. The women are always invited to, to bring some swears. We have a very special need for the nursery next week. Next week is going to be Youth Sunday. And unknowingly, um, Christine volunteered for the nursery, but she's also one of our teachers. So to um, free her up from the nursery so she could be here with her class, we have a special need for a nursery person um, to be in the nursery next week. If you're able to do that, um, I would um, see the sign-up sheet or talk to me. <coughs> Whoa, sorry. Whoa. <laughs> I've had pneumonia this week. This is that bad. Um, I understand Beverly has a moment of concern. See the head of the trustees come up, you know what it's going to be about, right? Um, during this year, the final the third state glass window has been a concern all the way through here to get it done. The original costs when they were done in '95 was 23,000 and some change. Well, when I got asked for a review of that, well, they gave me the review, it went up to 32. And I went, whoa, seems like it went up an awful lot. Well, the bottom line is he ended up with 28, he got another bid, and said the person, same person that did the first two would match the original one. So we're at 27,900 to do the last window. Um, there's no question it's not going to go down. We know that. And I think it's, we decided at the trustee meeting on Thursday night that it's in our best interest to book it at that price, lock it in, and it should be done next summer. Um, the bottom line is we have in the fund, we've been saving all the way through here, uh, 19000 The half circle has 4000 that they want to put towards the window, which means, which means we have a little over 5000 that we need to raise before next summer. Uh, not at a particularly high, it's a lot of money to me, $5,000, but I think we can do it and we have to have special projects or if someone is especially interested in it, um, those are the numbers we should talk about is $5,000. Um, the other one is our general fund is very low. Okay, we're in the red. Um, any extra money or anything to review your, your uh, giving for this time of the year, we appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Since there was a moment of concern, people also asked me to mention the badgers, just in case uh, we could give them any help. I said after yesterday, I don't know that anybody can help them, but anyway. Um, you're all invited to a wonderful coffee this morning. We're doing a little change today in that the coffee's going to be back in the warm room. We're going to try this out and see how it feels and how, uh, how the fellowship goes. 
And this coffee today is provided by the half circle here in um, our church, the ladies of the church. And there is a pink sheet that is available in the back that tells a little bit about the half circle. And we would like to invite all women of the church who might be interested to come to a pop-up meeting on October 15th at 6 p.m. downstairs. Come for good fellowship, good food, and an opportunity to challenge your time, talents, and treasures. Now, I'll emphasize those three T's and say, in those three things, it does not say meetings. We do have monthly meetings, but we're not asking new members to come yet to another meeting, but we sure could use some help, such as things like today for the coffee, fixing bars, etc. And then also to remind you, today is the festival downtown, and our church has a booth, and Half Circle does, and we're selling brooms. So if you'd like to make a clean sweep this weekend, go down and pick up one of those wonderful brooms. Thank you. Because the coffee is going to be in the war room and the uh, library area, I am going to be standing at that door this morning greeting people as a reminder to come that way and then go into um, to have fellowship. So you're not going to find me in the back this morning. Are there any other announcements or concerns? Carolina for his health. 
And on a wooded lot, cleared the trees and built a house. They went down in a 1929 Chevy truck with ball tires. And they lived on that truck while they built the house. And 95 pounds ring and wet used to come along to pull stuff and haul concrete blocks to build that house. Always a lad. Always gentle, but tough. She had to be. Life was tough. We're hoping those windows will inspire you to have her kind of faith. Thank you.
last year and a half. It feels as though we have been friends forever. I have taken a few things from a book by Anne Wings called Reaching for Rainbows. As Christians, we believe in God, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit, and in you and me. We believe the Holy Spirit has freed us to worship as a community. We believe the Holy Spirit works through daisies and wiggling children, choirs and banners, touching and praying, spontaneity and planning, tears and laughter, leading and supporting, words and listening, holding and letting go, scripture and hallelujahs, and we believe in love. Today is also a day how we're going to learn to use the New Century hymnal a little bit more. So I thought that to do that, we would use the unison prayer that is part of the service of communion we're going to use later. I would invite you to turn to page two, right at the very beginning of the book. And what the Book of Worship does is it gives us options in terms of if you follow all of service A or service B. And what I selected today was to use the unison prayer that is uh, marked with the little square with the A. And so that will be um, our liturgy for the unison prayer, and then later in the service we'll use the liturgy for the Lord's Supper. We are all called to examine our faithfulness to God's covenant with us, God, in whose presence we gather, promises us grace and pardon when we acknowledge our weakness and shame. Let us confess our sin to Almighty God. Eternal God, whose word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, we recognize and confess that we have failed to respond fully to your gracious presence in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, you have offered us new life, fulfillment, and freedom to serve you. We confess that we are captive to sin, that our sin binds us with false pride, and that the wrong we do is a burst at the good leading of another. For exile us to you and to all evil. God of mercy, forgive all our sin and strengthen us in you. Started making beautiful colored glass that went into windows. 
Now, as we look at, like, these windows, when you look at them, do you see a story in any of the windows? Most often, you see a story in stained glass windows. Now, also, the windows that Mrs. Hagler made, if you look at them, you'll see different symbols, different Christian symbols, and they tell us a story. <coughs> Now, some people think that when they started putting stained glass windows into churches, that they were trying to shut out the world and the reality that you would see through, you know, clear glass. But I think more than that, what was being shown was the glory of God as the light shines through some of these windows and brings beautiful colors into our sanctuary which gives us beautiful stories to look at and to think about that are portrayed as artists did them. I mean, have you ever been in this church when the sun isn't coming through this window? Maybe when it's darker? And is it more beautiful when the sun comes through? So God's creation becomes so much more beautiful when the light shines through. And there's something beautiful to give us color and light and beauty. So that's part of what we praise and part of what we love about stained glass windows. But now I have another lesson. It means you have to stand up. We have to try to make a circle as best we can around the communion table. You can, you can make it a little wider if you have to back there. See if you can get everybody included. Now, let it in. Let it fill in. There you go. Okay. Even guys, can you hold hands just for a second? There you go. Yeah, hold on your shirt sleeve, you know, whatever. Okay. Now, if we were to imagine, which it isn't tough to do today because communion is sitting here, if we were to imagine that the light of Christ was this table, that window, and the elements of communion, and if we were all standing around it this way, the light would shine on us, wouldn't it? And we would all be lit, wouldn't we? Okay, now everybody turn around and hold hands. But if we would choose to stand with our backs to the light of Christ, then would our faces be lit? No. And would we be able to shine? No. So what's important, turn around again, is that we face the light of Christ. And that we take in God's glory and that we too shine in all God's love. Does that make sense? So shine like a sunbeam. Okay? You could go back and sit with your families. I love you.
from God, our Creator, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Pro football star Sean Gilbert sat out the 1997 season because the Washington Redskins had offered him only $20 million over the next five years. $1 million a season less than the figure that came to him the summer before, as he said, as a revelation from God. For $4 million a year, Mr. Gilbert is not willing to do what football players do. Granted that Gilbert was an employee and not a servant of the Washington Redskins, but we can ask, where is that line between what is reasonable and expected and then the absurd? As a working man, he and we seek one kind of reward, but as Christians, what kind of reward do we seek as that unique place in life? Today's passage offers some wisdom about over-recognition. Jesus skillfully points out that servants should not expect accolades for doing what servants are supposed to do. If we, by definition, are called to serve those around us, then simply fulfilling our defined responsibility should provoke no great recognition. In fact, true and worthy recognition is trivialized when it is dished out too easily or announced too widely or too frequently. Truth, said Mark Twain, is such a precious commodity, it should be used very sparingly. The same is true of well-timed and sincere words of appreciation. Keep in mind, the passage does not rule out the principle of reward for our recognition. In fact, Jesus himself often used the principle of reward in many of his other parables. And you will remember those words when he said, Well done, good and faithful servant. I have made you well. Rise and go about your way. There is a reward. There was appreciation, even on Jesus' part. Nor does it condone the master's treatment of the servant as acceptable behavior. Again, Jesus himself modeled and advocated the kind of servant leadership that stoops as low as the foot basin and puts in perspective power and privilege. Whoever would be greatest among you, let him be servant to all, Jesus said. It does find a redeemable lesson in most unlikely of settings, a household of servants. So as long as we don't fall into error of drawing more from a parable than Jesus intended, his singular, lucid, and incisive point fairly leaps off the page to us this morning. He would say, true servants don't demand a pat on the back for every worthy deed. The passage clearly excludes the demand or high expectation of reward as the ground and motivation for obedience, as if we're somehow just entitled to rewards because we even just showed up to do something. Whether or not the master chooses to reward his servants is his own business. He probably will, but the servants should not wait to determine the potential reward before they decide to serve. There remains such a thing as duty, obligation without any guarantee of reward. We don't serve because we're rewarded. We're rewarded because we serve. Suppose there were two teams who were instru instructed to mow the lawn. One would say, okay, and the other said, how much will you give me for it? Now which one are you going to enjoy paying? The one who expects no reward. In humanly contrived models, the service is optional and appreciation is obligatory. Within the kingdom of God, the service is obligatory. God calls us to serve, to teach, to preach, to minister to our fellow person. And the appreciation is optional. How 
hard is it to toil without anyone's noticing and without any promise of the kind of appreciation that we undoubtedly deserve? Although we're accustomed to calling ourselves servants of God, we can tell if it's true by how we react when we've done something and received no congratulations. Do we really expect that congratulations and appreciation as we do good deeds? Surprise, servants serve without any expectation of reward. How many men upon pitching in with work around the house don't expect to be thanked by their spouse? I remember thanking Emily and Andrew's father for watching the children when I went to work. And I thought, yo, they're his children too. Why am I thanking him for babysitting and do fathers really babysit? No, they watch their children just as mothers watch their children when fathers are at work. After all, fathers of the last generation rarely felt any compulsion to assist with housework. Should today's postmodern dads, who typically change diapers a lot more than their ancestors, expect a little recognition for their contribution to domestic life? Or is it simply their duty? How do we expect that thanks? How many of us don't work extra hard on a proposal, or at a party, or on a report, or on a sermon, craving the kind of attention or recognition that we rarely experience. Oh, I'm not going to work hard on that. They're not going to recognize that I that I did all those graphs and made that report and made it beautiful and found it gorgeous. They're not going to even recognize that, so I'm not going to work so hard. How often can we bring ourselves to do the right thing just because it's right? Because it's what servants do. How much money would we give if we could do it anonymously? How much time would be spent in community service if nobody knew that we were doing it? How hard would we work on the new project if someone else got the credit for it? We tend to work harder on our lawns, which are seen, than on our basements and our attics, which aren't seen. But they both, and all, need to be done. Quit looking at him. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> the desire to have our contributions noticed and appreciated is certainly not new. It's very human. It's not unusual or necessarily wrong. Nor should we refrain from express expressing genuine and well-timed affirmation to others. Once a year, we recognize those who serve our church as officers and serve on committees. We have yet to recognize our Sunday school teachers and will do so next Sunday as we make a covenant between church and parents and, and congregation and teachers. But I trust that parents and members of the congregation will express their appreciation to our officers and to those who serve on committees throughout the year just because you know that you need to because they work hard on your behalf. And that we'll show our appreciation next week by touring the Sunday school rooms, even if your child isn't even in that room, or you don't have a child in Sunday school here. And we'll ooh and we'll ah and we'll say, thank you so much for putting up with my child and these children for that hour on Sunday morning. And teaching them and guiding them and volunteering to be with them because that's so important. Our emphasis last month was on the gift of time. And while we didn't talk about it very much, I hoped that it was being demonstrated by who Sue was last week when she came to speak to us about her mission, about volunteering to go to Haiti with her church and work with them. It required not only her volunteering her time in terms of 10 days in Haiti, but it also required her husband's volunteering to take off that time as his vacation and stay home with the children and watch them. <coughs> her volunteering her time was the idea and the epitome of which many of us cannot fulfill because 
We need to earn that living. We need to be with family. We need to be involved in that. But it was, I hope, an example of volunteering her time. Isn't it funny in our society that the people who deal directly with people, and in many cases the ones we trust our loved ones to, are the ones that are paid the least? <coughs> the child care workers, the aides in nursing homes, home health aides, servers in restaurants, that deal directly with us and touch our lives so intimately are the ones that are rewarded monetarily the least. So the least we can do is to thank them. They are the ones who must truly find their rewards in other places. As we discern what gifts or talents we have to offer for God's glory, let us look to what we know is the right thing to do, even when we don't receive any identifiable reward. Let us remember that God calls us to serve, to preach, to teach, to baptize, to heal, in God's name and for God's glory. There comes a time, and it comes with frequency, that we must not let a lack of recognition from others cripple our own desire to want to serve and to do our best. For in the final analysis, nothing escapes the notice of the one to whom we will answer in eternal life. Our God, who sees in secret, will reward us openly. For all God's glory, let us serve unexpectedly. Amen. Would you join me at this time in our call to prayer? To you, O Lord, we offer our prayers. Teach us your ways, O Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and most wonderful God, in season and out of season, we praise your name and bring glory to you through our efforts, through our servitude, through volunteering, through giving of our time and talent and treasure. We thank you, O God, for all who have gone before us and shown us the way, who have been faithful servants and served in your name and served this church or their family or served any other church, but have let that light shine through like a beacon. We thank you, O God, for all you have called together this morning to worship and praise you, to celebrate your presence, to offer forgiveness, to take upon your grace. We thank you, O oh God. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us this morning. We remember those who are unable to be here <coughs> because of illness. We remember Lana and Dorothy and Ruth and Harvey and Ruth and Elsie and Mildred. <coughs> we celebrate that Curtis is home and healthier and pray for his continued health. And so let us bring to you, O oh God, in this time of concern, our prayers as we pray to the Lord. Put within us the spirit to listen, O God, for your answers in our lives, whether they be the still, small voice or the exuberant aha. Help us to listen, O God, for all your love and your responses for our lives, as we pray in Jesus' name.
Shall we pray? Thank you, God, for the strength of your love, and help us to remember that this money belongs to you, and may it be used for your glory. hymn in preparation for communion is found in your new century hymnal number 539 won't you let me be your servant Please be seated. And likewise, this will be a new experience for us as we follow the order for uh, communion. Um, in your New Century Hymnal, beginning on page 5. I would remind you that today is Worldwide Communion Sunday. It is a Sunday when churches of many different traditions, but Christian nonetheless, would recognize the presence of their Lord with the supper before us. And so Dixie has very graciously prepared the plates of bread before you this morning with a variety of breads to remind us that we're a society where white bread is, is maybe our main staple, but people from different countries and different places may celebrate with bread that is nonetheless indigenous to them. So you have a choice before you this morning as the plate comes before you. I would invite you to turn to down the page to the invitation, and we will follow together as best as we are able. Beloved in Christ, the gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, and on that same day, sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. 
This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere, and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news born of Mary, our sister in faith. Christ live among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered, with your sons and daughters of faith in all places and times. We praise you with joy. Go over to the all on the next page, page 7. Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion and on the eve of death, Jesus gathered the disciples for the feast of Passover. Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to you, broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we re re proclaim the mystery of our faith. Together, Christ's death, O God, we proclaim. Christ's resurrection, we declare. Christ's coming, we await. Glory be to you, O God. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith, recalling Christ's suffering and death, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection and awaiting Christ's return in victory. We spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service in behalf of all people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit on this bread and wine, on our gifts and on us, Strengthen your universal church that it may be the champion of peace and justice in all the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Be present with us in all our lives that we may know you as the Holy One who with Christ and the Holy Spirit lives forever. Amen. Let us pray as Christ our Savior has taught us to pray. Number A. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forevermore. Amen. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. 
The gifts of God for the people of God come for all things are ready. Ministering to you in God's name, I give you this bread and ask that you take it and receive it and then we will partake together. Ministering to you in the same manner, let us take the cup and hold it that we may all receive it together.
Let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Again, A. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And after they supped together, they sang a hymn. Our final hymn this morning is number 357, You Are Called to Tell the Story. Let us stand as we sing together. May God's grace and God's glory, God's love and God's peace be with you as you go from this place. As all we do, we do to the glory of God. Amen. <laughs>